clarion call for a country, for a world to move away from fossil fuels. This is it, but we can't do it overnight. Welcome to the Coventry and Warwickshire Green Business Programme podcast. Subscribe now for more episodes. Hello, welcome to the Green Business Programme podcast. Climate change is a massive global issue which has united people, businesses and countries. Only together can we mitigate the worrying damage done to the environment and our life support systems. Coventry is committed to tackling climate change and reducing greenhouse gas emissions for the city. The challenge of reducing the city's carbon emissions, of course, is significant and it will be helped by everyone in Coventry to help us all get there. One important step was taken in November 2021, when senior leaders from organisations across the city formed Coventry's Climate Change Board. I'm John Bates, and in this episode, we will find out more about the board and its members, and also a bit more about how Coventry is planning to navigate its journey towards net zero. Let me introduce our guests, board members Margot James, the former Minister of Culture, Communications and Creative Industries, and Executive Chair of the Warwickshire Manufacturing Group at the University of Warwick, and Suzanne Ward. Suzanne is Area Environment Manager for the Environment Agency, covering West Midlands Combined Authority and Warwickshire. We'll also be joined a bit later by Councillor Jim O'Boyle, who is the Vice Chair of the Board and Cabinet Member responsible for Jobs, Regeneration and Climate Change the council. So warm welcome Margot and Suzanne, thank you very much for sparing the time to come on the podcast. Um, Margot if I could start with you please, so you've been selected to chair the board and uh, and it's met a few times already, um, what, what, why did you want to be part of it and, and what do you see as the main objectives? Well, thanks very much for the introduction. Um, well John I was delighted to be approached with this opportunity of chairing the climate change board for the city. I thought Really, one thing I was so keen on doing it is because my role at the University of Warwick, chairing the Warwick Manufacturing Group, involves me in a huge amount of work, most of which is dedicated to helping industry achieve net zero by 2050. And some of the targets are more ambitious than that even. So I felt I could bring a lot of expertise to the board and also... Um, learn a lot about something that's very close to my heart by chairing it as well. Because one of the great things about the board is that the City Council have done a great job, as you alluded to in your introduction. It's it's gone a long way. It's further along this road than most councils. But to get to its most vigorous target that you mentioned, 55% reduction by 2030, it really does need to work in partnership with the other parts of the city that are going to make this happen or not. And I'm thinking private sector, the public utilities, the voluntary sector and residents and citizens. So the City Council did a great job really with the things that were under its direct control. It now needs to embrace partner organisations. And I felt I was in a good position because of my previous experience in government and at the university to assist them in that effort, which I think is extremely important. So, Margot, you referenced um, your work with the Warwickshire Manufacturing Group and just wonder whether you could tell us a little bit more about that because um, there's, there's a lot of work going on in terms of addressing climate change there. So just share a little bit of that with us, if you Yes. Will. Essentially, you can only cut carbon where, where carbon is. And, you know, 29% of our emissions are related to transport. And I would say that WMG's work is at least 50% on dedicated towards the reduction of transport emissions. Given that, I knew that I could contribute because that is the work that we are doing at WMG very successfully. We're leading the charge towards the electrification of transport and that will be very beneficial for the city. Obviously, we'll be able to help electrify the, the big vehicles, cars, in, in a way that also builds employment opportunities for people who live locally. So it's a very important contribution, I think, that we've got to make at WMG. And certainly in a previous episode of this podcast, we've talked about 
some of the initiatives that are underway around transport. So there's lots of synergy there. That's really good. I wonder if you could tell us about the composition of the board and, and how many members there are and, and perhaps the selection process and how it was decided that they should become members. Right. Um, well, it, we're quite a large board. We've got about 15 members. They've been targeted really for the expertise and the support that they can bring as I can bring the support from WMG members like E.ON which are headquartered here in Coventry can bring huge expertise into the reduction of emissions overall particularly from the energy sector and also domestic housing probably next to transport buildings and housing is the next greatest emitter so we are very pleased to have E.ON's expertise and they are very hands-on they are really allowing us to use their resources to help the city reduce its emissions which is fantastic and then we have other members along things like the utilities we have the nhs we have the ambulance service we have, we have the police force so we've got all, all the public sector engagement and if you think that for example i mentioned how important transport emissions are to get reduced well five percent of journeys undertaken across the city are health related. So that's, that's a big chunk. And then of course the NHS are heavy energy users with a lot of the equipment they use. And so we want to get their expertise involved, how they're doing. And that's the same for all of the contributing members, really. What are they doing? Coventry Building Society is a member from the private sector. They've already hit their initial target of being carbon free in terms of an independent entity. They've got some way to go meeting other targets, but let's have their best practice. A lot of it is also about sharing best practice. So when we've got good performers like Coventry Building Society, we want to other parts of the city to learn from their experience. So a lot of it's about that. And then there are organisations representing the area of conservation and diversity. We have the Canal and Waterways Trust. We have the Coventry and Warwickshire Wildlife Trust. All of these things are vital to the way in which we reduce our carbon footprint. And incidentally, they are very important ways of reaching the wider public as well, because, for instance, the Wildlife Trust have thousands of members. So through their offices and other organisations that belong to the board, we'll be able to engage with the, directly with the public, uh, which is vital to the success of our mission. So was it easy to get their involvement or uh, was a little bit of um, twisting of arms required? I mean, in general, people have been really willing to step up and that, that's really pleasing. You know, we've had a few hiccups, you know, because particularly with the voluntary sector, they are short of personnel, resources and so forth. They, they can't afford to spend themselves too thin. There's no shortage of willingness, but sometimes there is a shortage of resource, which we, we obviously have to patch up in some other way. Now, I don't need to tell the residents of Coventry, but of course, um, the, the city's got a strong history of inventiveness and creativity with a real strong track record of adapting to, to change. What difference do you think that the board um, will be able to make adapting to the challenges of climate change? Well, I think the communications and the public engagement is very important to this because obviously all climate change in the end involves a degree of behavioural change, some of which is very easy to bring on board, but sometimes old habits die hard, you know, and also sometimes there can be an upfront cost. I mean, at the moment, switching to an electric vehicle usually carries an upfront cost. And we are working at WMG with partners to remove that cost differential, but we haven't quite got there yet. There's important challenges that we need to, to be aware of. And I think that we are well on the way with the support of the sort of partners we have got in getting there. I mean, I'll give you an example. The, the City Council is so ahead in this area, as I've already, already alluded to, but they commissioned WMG five years ago to develop a brilliant carbon-free light rail solution to some of the issues thrown up by public transport. And we're very, very nearly at the point at which we can demonstrate that and the safety of that vehicle is, and the track on which it will be laid. Now that will, when it's finally in situ, 
that will involve a behavioural change. There will be less and less excuse to use your private vehicle, your private car, to undertake short journeys. By the time the city council and the university have perfected some of these other transport options, like the very light rail option, like other forms of smaller personal mobility, they will be coming in for the city to benefit from within the next five years, some of them within the next two to three years. And then there will be an important challenge to us all to encourage people to actually use these options. I have no doubt that we will be successful because they are so attractive to use, but they do require engagement with the public so that the public not only understand the importance of using these alternatives to cars, but also the benefits to them personally in so doing. Okay, so um, Suzanne, um, I'll bring you in now, if I may. So the way that um, things have been organised is that there are five pathways, and we'll we'll put the details of the pathways in, in the notes that go with this podcast. But you've agreed to lead the Resilient Development Working Group. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what that work involves? Yes, thank you, John. And um, we know climate change is already happening. It's We've seen it over the last few years where we've either had too much water, too little water, the temperatures are increasing and various things around the world and particularly just in the UK itself. And so it's really important that we learn how to adapt to reduce obviously the carbon and therefore the impact on the environment. But it's already happening. So we as a society need to learn to live with those changes that are already in train and are happening. So being part of that and being able to do practical things on the ground, working with businesses, working across Coventry and with partners, the idea is that we can actually start to make some practical adaptions and cultural changes because I think Margot mentioned culturally we have to change the way we think about things. We've always thought about water as being this abundant resource in the UK that we could just turn on the taps and it would always be there. This year has proved that that is not the case. I mean that that is one of the issues for the Environment Agency. It's almost you, at some point you've got too much and another point you, you haven't got enough. So just talk a little bit about the issues that the Environment Agency is facing. So the agency as in facing actually is that whole point of incident, uh, sort of the, the thing that's probably foremost in most people's minds and what they see from the Environment Agency. So in, in January, February, we had far too much water. Some of our rivers were actually, we saw them at the highest level they've ever been in the country. That caused heartache and absolute devastation for the families and the communities that got flooded out. And sometimes for some of them, that has been multiple times over multiple years. And then we are roll forward, what, six, seven months? We've had months now of the lowest rainfall recorded levels in the UK and England. We've got, the agency's now got 10 of its 14 areas are actually in declared drought. Wales has declared drought. And there is no foreseeable rain in the forecast going forward. And that's a real issue for the agency to manage, isn't it? It is, because we work with the water companies to manage that precious resource called water. And we have to balance the need of all of us in society. So we want to be able to drink. We need to have the taps on. Businesses need to operate. But we have to also protect the environment. Because if we destroy it, it won't come back. And much of our environment relies on having a healthy water. Now, if I, if I can perhaps put a question to, um, to both of you, perhaps uh, Margot first. Um, compared with other cities, um, what would you say that's unique about um, Coventry and, and the, the action and the steps that it's taken to, to combat climate change? Well, I think one of the most important things about the city is that it, it got onto this issue early. As you mentioned in your introduction, John, it had already reduced its emissions by 27%, I think it was, by 2014. But that is way ahead of most other cities of its size around the country. Um, it's one of the first uh, two or three um, city authorities to have um, appointed a climate change board to scrutinise its um, efforts and progress 
towards the next range of targets. So I think that Coventry is well placed because, because of that. So it's always good to be joining something where you think there's a, there's a good chance of success. And the other thing I think about the city is that it is the home of the transport industry. Um, and therefore, it attracts investment globally into its transport networks and um, its manufacturing industry, which is a lot of which is geared to the supply chain, to the automotive sector. And it's got manufacturing here uh, geared to that sector, which is of itself um, legally required to change very rapidly from 2030. They will not be allowed to sell new cars with internal combustion engines. And that really focuses the mind, because if you think about the lead time of, you know, from drawing board to actually rolling off the production line and into the showrooms, that's a few years. So we haven't got long. So they're very dedicated. They've commissioned us to do a lot of the research involved in the electrochemistry around the battery side of the innovation. And that means the city is very well placed to hit its targets even its new targets earlier than most cities of a similar size. And so there's a lot of things, I think, uh, related to our heritage, but very much, if not more so, related to our current and future industry um, and the way we generate wealth in the city that make us a good candidate for success in this field. And there's a strong culture of sort of partnership working, isn't there? So, and Suzanne, the particular challenges that business face. So if you're working alongside business and trying to help business, yeah. perhaps you could talk about the challenges that business faces. Well, business face the challenges of depending on where they are located, they could be at risk of flooding and therefore that really puts an additional pressure and cost on businesses. They could also be, if they have high energy or high water uses, again, those have a big impact on them, particularly if that's impacted going forward. But one of the big things that Coventry has been really good at has been a pioneer about environmental net gain and around that ability for sustainable growth. So it's pioneered that whole ability that, yes, we absolutely want to have development here, but actually when you're developing, we want you to understand your impact, environmental impact, and then actually mitigate it plus a bit more. So actually we're making it country more sustainable to these changes that are already happening. Lovely. Thank you very much uh, to both of you. And uh, uh, listeners, if you want to find out more about the work of the board, you can have a look for details on the website and all the contact details are there. We'll put those in the show notes as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, John. Okay, so I've just moved down the corridor to a different committee room and I'm joined by Councillor Jim O'Boyle, who is the Vice Chair of the Board and Cabinet Member responsible for Jobs, Regeneration and Climate Change at the Council. Jim, thank you very much for sparing the time to come on the podcast. Um, you were obviously instrumental in getting the Board established. Why do you think it was important to do that? Well, my role as a Cabinet Member of the City Council is to, is to bring forward proposals to tackle climate change in our city but I know that as a council we can't do that on our own. I mean there's always a school of thought that said councils can solve all known problems to man but the truth is we can't so what I want to do is bring together different partners, businesses, experts in this field who can bring forward recommendations, tangible projects that can make a fundamental difference to reducing our carbon footprint as a city not just as a council. Internally, as a council, we're working on various projects that we can reduce our carbon footprint, but actually we're just a small proportion of the overall people, businesses that live and work in our city. And therefore, it's absolutely vital that these recommendations come forward and we can demonstrate that actually this is a, if you like, an all Coventry uh, solution to what is ultimately not just a local problem, a national problem, but it's a a world problem. So we've got some of the best brains in the field to tackle and look at some of these issues. Now, it seems it's quite a, quite a complex task, isn't it, to engage with all of these various audiences and, and organisations. Is, is that going well? 
In terms of setting up the, the board itself, it is going very well. And I'm very pleased with the sort of representation that we've got. One of the things I wanted to do was to have some of the energy companies who are often seen in, in the wider context of, of our country as some of the, if you like, authors of some of the problems that we face. But they are experts in their field of energy and they're on this journey in order to move to fossil free fuels. And actually, that is something that I want to tap into as a city. We need to tap into that energy, that expertise, that that knowledge. We've got, we've got academics on board, we've got the public sector on board, we've got the third sector, we've got the Warwickshire Wildlife Trust. We're not leaving anything or anybody out because everybody is bringing different skills and different understandings to the table so that we can actually pick the best of what it is we need in order to be able to help support our climate change initiatives as a city. So the economic climate is obviously difficult. That's presenting some great challenges. And the, the sorts of solutions that are being brought forward have, will have a financial impact. Is, is that easily managed in the financial climate that we're in? No, it's not. I mean, the, the, the economic challenges that are facing our residents, the economic challenges that is, is facing our country are absolutely profound. I mean, you, you asked earlier on, we've just come out of a climate change board meeting and you asked how it went and what we discussed. And the truth is, I've, I've, I've said that the, the cost of living crisis, the energy crisis, is not just a crisis, it's a national emergency. We're seeing that people living in some of the poorer parts of our city are going to be dramatically adversely affected by the rise in, in fuel prices. But actually, a huge proportion of our residents, regardless of where they live, and relatively how well off they are, are going to be massively affected as well. And that is because gas prices are going through the roof. If ever there was a, a clarion call for a country, for a world to move away from fossil fuels, this is it. But we can't do it overnight. We need that support. We need both that financial support from government. And ultimately, only government can do it. And actually, that sort of intervention, the sort of intervention I would say, is very similar to what happened in 2000. And eight, when you had the, the massive worldwide recession, whereby the government stepped in to protect the banks, because if the banks went under, people's savings, people's houses, people's jobs would all have been lost. The public purse would have suffered, and so that would have then obviously uh, dramatically decreased the opportunity for us to move from recession into growth. We are in that process again, but it's actually even worse. And I think what we need to do to protect both our utility companies to protect the customers, protect our residents and our country. We need to do exactly the same again. Take them over, actually take control, back them up financially as a country in order to see us through to the next the next phase, then see what we do. So these these issues are tremendously serious. Never mind the fact, and we've seen a summer of wildfires, of, of, of rain and water shortages these are the these are the direct consequences we're now facing in terms of using fossil fuel it's just doubling problem onto problem it's really dramatic a national crisis and you talk about the, you know the phases so i guess the next phase is around the climate change strategy for coventry and are you setting about publishing a strategy the strategy will be ready for publication in march uh, next year after cabinet approves the final recommendations there's a public consultation early in the new year so the strategy can become operational in the new financial year running from april 23 through to 2030 this is a big piece of work and the point is this is not just about as i said at the start it's not just about the city council this is about our city. We can make a difference as a city, but we are one small cog in the wheel of both the West Midlands and, of course, in terms of the country. But our strategy is busily being put together and it'll be ready for publication in the spring. And can residents and businesses help contribute to that? Well, our green business team will run events with the business network, the green business network. And so we're in a position to consult with different people, some circular economy, sustainability matters. We'll also running we'll also be running a hybrid launch event for the strategy consultation, followed by a series of 
consultation events during December this year through to February, which we're going to hold in, in neighbourhoods around the city, and they're going to include online virtual events as well. In other words, we're trying to reach the, as wide a possible audience from the public, the private, and of course, sector from our residents as well. And it's important that we engage with them because obviously, you know, this is about our city and we want our city and its people to take part. Jim, I've been hearing um, through this sort of series of podcasts that there's lots of initiatives that are going on to reduce initiatives in the, the, the city. And I just wonder about local sort of decarbonisation targets. Is, is, is that something that um, is in place in Coventry? Look, the truth is here, we must work towards as early as possible as a city, as a country, to reduce our carbon footprint to zero. But it would be completely wrong for me, as the cabinet member responsible of the city council, to say, we are signing up to a target. We do not have the levers. We do not have the tools for us to actually achieve that. However, what we can do is work with our partners in business, work with our partners in the public sector, work with different businesses and industry across our country to bring them together to actually work in a way that actually leads us towards pathway towards carbon zero. And that's the much more honest approach. And anybody who looks at this, we know that all the experts are telling us 2050 as a country is completely unachievable based on the pathway uh, uh, the government are, are on at the moment. We're going to get absolutely nowhere near that. They're not taking it seriously, as far as I can see, and as far as the experts say. 2041 by the combined authority is, quite frankly, not achievable. Not because there isn't the will. There's the will, but unless you've got the tools, unless you've got the finance to do it, then it's not going to happen. As a city alone in Coventry, the council do not own everybody's house, everybody's flat, and yet if you don't make those... Uh, properties carbon zero using fossil free fuel then I'm afraid your pledges about uh, carbon zero country are utterly fatuous it doesn't exist Coventry alone I think you're talking about to do that to insulate to make these uh, properties able to be completely free from fossil fuel energy efficient 15 billion pounds the the council's uh, budget a year to deliver social services, to deliver transport, to deliver the bins and the lighting and the roads, etc., is about a billion pounds alone. Fifteen billion is more than the country is spending as a whole on the whole of these initiatives across the country. So people have to get real, the government have to get real, and our climate change board is starting to understand and tackle those issues. Councillor Jim O'Boyle, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this podcast and I hope you found it interesting. I would encourage you to listen to previous episodes in this series to hear about all the great things going on in Coventry and Warwickshire to help businesses and others combat climate change. My thanks to the guests, Margot James, Suzanne Ward and of course, Councillor Jim O'Boyle. You can keep up to date with Coventry's latest green news and events by joining our Green Business Network, which allows businesses to come together, share ideas and promote energy, resource, waste and water efficiency, as well as engage on low carbon, environmental and green sustainability initiatives. The network is free to join and open to everyone. The Green Business Programme is part funded by the European Regional Development Fund and delivered by Coventry City Council, Coventry University and Coventry University Enterprises. This podcast was produced by Maria Kovlia. I'm John Bates. Thanks for listening. <laughs>